Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I would like to welcome Dr. Dina Minnick, an internationally recognized teacher, author, scientist, speaker, and artist. She has more than 20 years of diverse, well-rounded experience in the fields of nutrition and functional medicine, including clinical practice, research, product formulation, writing, and education. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Minnick. Oh, thank you for having me. So let's go back to your youth a couple of years ago. <laughs> and um, what initially inspired you to study what you've studied in both uh, college, your master's, and your PhD? It's all about my mom. It's I give all credit to my mother. And, you know, if I look at her journey, so much of her life changed my life. So when I was around eight or nine years old, as I was growing up in the 1970s, my mom got into her food and faith simultaneously. And it was because she was pregnant with my brother at the time, and there was a different level of awareness around health. And now I have this baby that I have to take care of, and I think that there were some seeds of nutrition that had been planted by people like Adele Davis. If you look at even uh, people like Jack LaLanne getting into health, Richard Simmons. I mean, my mom was really, at the time, we would call her a health nut. And for me, I was really polarized to it. So I would have never thought that her path could have influenced me like it has today, where I went on to get master's in nutrition, a PhD in nutrition. I went on to now lecture in nutrition. I feel like everything that followed thereafter was really because of my mom. Uh, so sometimes the things that affect us greatly, and we could say for, for what we think would be positive or negative, they're going to have some role in our lives ultimately. So um, even though for me it was pretty traumatic to have this kind of upbringing where my mom was really into food and faith, like she was very extreme. We didn't have a microwave. The kids at school had peanut butter and jelly on Wonder Bread sandwiches, and I had my brown bread sandwich with peanut butter and banana. So even small things like that. Now I look at how cutting edge she was, but at the time it was kind of like bleeding edge instead of cutting edge. It was like you're kind of getting out there with nutrition in ways that people weren't accustomed to. And I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Chicago, so this was the land of meat and potatoes. So it was kind of radical. Did you ever want to rebel when you weren't at home? <laughs> I did Sneak rebel. Out. Did I, I ever did. want okay. to? I did <laughs> rebel. I snuck candy. I... Even when I had to go to Girl Scout outings, my mom would have me bring separate food. Separate, she didn't want me drinking Kool-Aid. So I had to bring my own food. But, of course, I snuck. In fact, I think it made me sneak even more and led to a lot of emotional eating when I was a teenager. And from that place, I really came into the, the connection between emotions and food. Before, it was always, you know, I couldn't eat certain things. I never really realized how much we have invested in food from an emotion point of view, memories, um, just associations with relatives, events. So I think that that has made me more well-rounded in my approach as a functional nutritionist is to have not just the what of eating, the how, the when, the why, looking at it more broadly. And what about the result of that? Do you recall a time where you did eat the things that you were forbidden of eating and not feeling well afterwards? Oh, sure. <laughs> But, you, <laughs> but it didn't matter, matter at the time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for me, it was sugar. And so for me, it was, you know, a whole package of Oreo cookies. It was sneaking candy at the convenience store. Um, you know, and there was, I even think symbolically about people's draw to sugar. Why is it that we're so inundated with so many sugary products and we still feel the connection? And I do think there is that sense of the the high that we get, kind of the, the, the brain chemistry that changes with it. I mean, there are significant studies on this showing that sugar, white sugar, is more addictive than some of the most addictive drugs. It is a drug. So fortunately, I came out of that emotional eating, high sugar eating, but I have so much compassion for people that are still very much connected into it, and they can't see out of it. So, you know, just in my own process and healing, I can... 
I have different ways that I can help them with that. So here you rebelled as a, in your youth um, during this food and faith time in your mother's life. What brought on the epiphany that you wanted to go ahead and actually study this? That's an excellent question because I was so rebellious. I mean, everything was leading towards constriction in my life. My dad was a police officer, very strict. I went to Catholic school, wore uniforms, all girls, very strict, taught by nuns. I mean, it was like I had to just bust out of this. So I went to college, and I thought I would be a medical doctor. I was always a nerd, right? I was always kind of the science nerd, and I was always burying my head in books about the body, I think because I had so many maladies. You know, I had gut symptoms. I had really bad endometriosis, um, and really bad, where I would be vomiting uh, every month, uh, just really feeling so much pain and just a level of discomfort that just wasn't, it didn't seem to be typical for teenagers, right? So coming into being a woman, I felt like it was a very painful process. So I was always trying to understand my body better, but I never put it together with food. I thought, there's always something else out there. So let me take an antibiotic for my acne. Let me take a, uh, a pain pill for my cramps. I wasn't thinking broadly into food, but I was really tuned into science and medicine. So I thought, I'm going to go and be a medical doctor, go that route. And every summer that I would come home from the university, I would work for a medical doctor. I'd work at the hospital. And then um, I had this epiphany, back to your question. As I was working one summer, I had worked for a cardiologist. I worked for an ophthalmologist. I worked for an optometrist. And I was realizing that a lot of these situations were not very deep with the patient. I, I was actually sitting in, I was a medical assistant, so I was observing how the physician would work with the patient. And I was thinking to myself after one summer, I don't know if I could do this. I feel like these doctors are stressed. They're going in and they're talking with the patient for 10 minutes. They're hardly even listening. And I can tell that the patient hasn't really resolved what they came in looking for an answer to. And I thought, you know, being a medical doctor is such a stressful job. It's all or nothing. Do I really want to commit myself to this life of not having true answers for people? So then I decided to go and study nutrition. I, I was thinking maybe my mom was right. Maybe I do have to do something preventative rather than focus on treatment. And perhaps that's like my biggest gift of service. So I went on, I did my graduate work and did that in nutrition. And I kind of realized that most of the people studying nutrition all kind of had their nutrition, I would say, issues, right? So me with my mother, and then I kind of got into more extreme eating practices. I tried out all these different diets. There were other people there that were kind of obsessed with food, you know, trying to study it. So I felt like maybe this is where I belong, studying nutrition, really getting deeper into this. And I liked it so much, I went on to do a PhD in nutrition. So there was that turning point where I had to see it in motion. I think if I just stayed removed and never worked for a medical doctor, never worked at a hospital, I wouldn't have had quite that revelation. I would have still had this idealistic view of what I thought medicine was about until I actually was in the trenches, even for short bursts of time throughout the summer working with doctors. It just, it was enough for me to say, you know what, I. I don't think I can do it. And how do you impart your knowledge on your family? Oh, now? <laughs> so I have a, a healthy mom. My parents are both living, very healthy. Well, my mom is very healthy. My dad is completely the opposite. My dad's a junk food guy with a big heart, is what I call him. You know, he was a Chicago police officer, stressful job, sitting in the car a lot. Um, Loves donuts. <laughs> Yes, I think he does. He loves bread. <laughs> he loves bread. In fact, um, my great-grandmother came from Sweden, and she would bake this, the Swedish brown bread is what they referred to it as. And so my dad, still even to this day, has this fixation with the Swedish brown bread, which is basically like a white bread with a bunch of raisins in it. I don't eat it, but for him it's like an emotional thing. And my mom is, you know, she doesn't really eat it either. So, but my sister will eat it. And, you know, it just shows me how powerful food is from an emotional standpoint. And I like the fact that my parents are kind of yin and yang. My mom is really healthy. My dad, not so much. They have that dynamic tension. So how does what I know now, how do I impart it to my family? Well, 
I, I just don't think a prophet is ever recognized in her homeland. So my mom is really good with her knowledge. I don't have to impart anything. My dad, you know, I just, I had him in one of my programs. He had a lot of great benefits and results. And he was, you know, my best spokesperson in that regard. But he's fallen off the track. And, but he knows how to get back on, which is good. I think it's okay if we fall off that track as long as we have the awareness to know where to go. So when you got out of school and you went into practice, how did you begin? Mm. And how did you get into the functional medicine realm? Yeah. So, uh, like most things in life, things just kind of happen. You just start doing certain things. So when I finished my PhD, I went to work for a small startup company, which was had one nutritional product. And that was in the age of the dot-coms and the biotechs that were increasing and decreasing and rising and collapsing and I wasn't there very long and then I went on to work at a large food manufacturer and so I was working there for some time and really got to know the food industry I would say it was very interesting during that time I wasn't very happy because I realized like wow this is not really what I thought nutrition was about I really want to go deeper into food so I started practicing and I worked in a small practice, just part-time, because I had kind of my full-time thing going on, but I had a small part-time practice on the weekends with a psychiatrist, a chiropractor, and me. And I got to know some of the products that they were using. I, I was introduced to dietary supplements in a much larger way than I ever had been. And I just, I had some amazing people around me that really fueled and gave me the confidence to go further. Dr. Jeffrey Bland was part of that process. I remember I went to go see a, a Jeff Bland seminar. I think it was February 2003. It was my first um, connection with, with Jeff Bland, at least in person. That was transformational, you know, to see that, gosh, there are all these people that are really into nutritional medicine in ways that I want to be connected in. So then I took the leap and I went and worked with Jeff Bland, actually. I worked with him for 10 years also still had clinical, I worked in a clinic, I had my own small practice. So it was gradual, and I would say I'm kind of a hybrid, right? So my background is more sciency, and then I became clinically active with patients later. That wasn't my first thrust. My first thrust was really understanding mechanisms. My PhD was on essential fatty acid absorption and metabolism. My master's was on oxidative stress and carotenoids. So for me, that came in handy because I was able to already think in root cause as I got into nutritional medicine and the ways that functional medicine and integrative medicine are currently structured. So it was obvious. It's like, yeah, of course I would take that food to address this pathway in the cell. So my thinking was more in line with really getting at the root of why somebody has something. So how are the aspects of emotional, and mental, and spiritual health integrated into an overall approach to wellness? Well, first and foremost, I believe you have to start where the patient is at, wherever they're at. And some people are ready to change their physical bodies, which is perfect because I know exactly how they can do that with nutrition and lifestyle. Other people have done every single diet. They're really good with their bodily health, but they're still bothered mentally and emotionally by certain things, maybe things that have happened in their past. So I can work with them with different techniques in order to unearth some of that, especially as it relates to food eating in their bodies, their lifestyle, because it's all connected, right? So when we make a change in our bodies, we're actually making a change in our emotions, our mind, our spirit. I mean, it's a ripple effect. What we know now from just even modern medicine is that we have systems biology happening. So if we're changing the gut, we're changing the heart, we're changing the brain, we're changing the skin, we're changing everything. So it's the same with what you're asking about with physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. If we change our spiritual, our sense of meaning, calling, and purpose, we're going to change how we eat, how we behave, the thoughts that we're thinking, our emotions, our values, our beliefs. So everything is in alignment. So we are a whole and we're a web. We know that from traditional medicine systems too, like traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. So it's nothing really new, it's just bringing it within the context of a more whole self approach to health, which I think functional medicine and integrative medicine do very well, versus the, 
the more acute medicine model, which is pill for an ill, symptom relief, which we have a need for, obviously. But I think for the context of a person's life and really getting them to favor better lifestyle change, we have to look at the entire web. What I really hope for medicine in the 21st century is that we get back to the healing arts rather than private practice, which has a different feel to it. So it's really bringing in the left brain, the logical side, the, the intellect, and marrying that with the creative, artistic, sensing brain. And I feel like that part has been left behind because we glorify the intellect and we focus on what's the next study. And then we're off and running. And the, that study has been so flawed, right? So to me, it's about unification of these two different paradigms into one. Your bio says that, um, obviously, you're an internationally recognized teacher, author, scientist, speaker, and artist. So what is your art? Oh, gosh, I didn't even get into this. Yeah, you know, when I was having a lot of emotional issues in my 20s, I picked up a paintbrush and I had a large roll of paper. This was during my, my years when I was working on my doctorate. And I made my first painting. And it was just big and bright and it was yellow, red, and black, and I just put it up on my wall. It was, it looked like an amoeba. You know, there's no, I didn't, never took an art class. Um, I did later in life, and then I realized I don't want to be in an art class. Uh, you know, I have this, this thing that has to move through me, this, the, the flow. We all have it. We are all artists, actually. I think all of us should be saying that we're artists, but people have so much reservation about that. You know, like the mentality that an artist doesn't make money, or that if you're an artist, you're not intelligent you know it's it's chaotic it's creative it's emotional and you know we, we don't really want that I want us to embrace that and so the work that I do is all about color getting people to connect with color because I do think that when we open up to that creativity we open up to our emotions there's another door that opens when we open up to emotions we open up to our health and um, my personal story is that my endometriosis and a lot of my reproductive and hormonal issues did get better throughout time with food and supplements and activity and massage and all of those things, but didn't completely resolve until I was in a painting frenzy, quite honestly. I started, every time I would get emotional, and it wasn't a thinking process, I, I had to paint. And after a while, my, my then-to-be husband observed in my paintings that I was painting my ovaries in my uterus over and over and over again. And I was, you know how artists sometimes they have a certain look to their paint. I didn't realize, but he, he saw that I had a certain look to my paintings. <laughs> you know, the uterus, the ovaries. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right, Mark. And so I decided to really delve into that. Like, okay, maybe my body is needing to express. I didn't have children. Um, and so I was birthing something else that was coming through me. And I was being monitored by my gynecologist for years because I was getting worse issues with a blocked fallopian tube, more inflammation. I might have had to have surgery, these types of things, and I didn't want to have anything removed. The painting resolved all of it. I'm always a little I'm bit leery about saying that because so people think, is that, that. <laughs> So what I continued painting. Saying? Wow. Yeah. My, my doctor was shocked. Um, because we were doing ultrasounds every year just to monitor the swelling and the, what, what I had going on. And finally, one August, she said, it's not there anymore. I said, you better check again because those ultrasounds are like abstract art to me. And I just don't know. And she, she looked at it again. She's like, it's not there. She said, your uterus looks beautiful. Your blocked fallopian tube on your left side is completely gone. I just started crying, actually, because here I was vulnerable on the table. My legs are open, and she's scanning me. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe, like, I don't have to think about this anymore. And then once I was dressed and we were back in her office, she said, well, so what have you done different? I said, do you really want to know? <laughs> I just started painting. I even had a gallery. I had a small gallery showing of these paintings where I did all the phases of the uterus. What was it titled? Well, I didn't say it like that. I made it more discreet, but I had every painting was like conception, menstruation, fertilization, um, kind of menopausal, but I had a creative name for that. So um, 
I, I didn't have a, a set title for the exhibit, but in my mind, I knew what people were looking at. It was, this is my uterus, <laughs> or this is the uterus in all of her many forms. Like my feminine needed to come out. And I think being a science nerd and being in the masculine world of linear thinking, really, and again, growing up Catholic, growing up with a, with a strict, within a strict household, it left me feeling boxed in. And painting was the only thing that gave me freedom. Food didn't give me freedom. Painting and art led to the sense of just freeing my body. And really, and that's why everything I do now, I bring in color, I bring in creativity. Because to me, it's the missing element in health. We often go to the next supplement or the latest diet, but people aren't really latching on to the sense of the creative flow in us. And I really do think that when we stop flowing, we get sick, we stagnate. There's so much irony in that statement. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, my, my dad even has, in his own way, he'll, he has said to me, he says, D, when we stop moving, we start dying. And in a way, that's essentially what I'm saying with creative flow. When we stop flowing inside of us, moving, expressing, because again, um, emotional expression is not glorified. It's seen as weakness, right? It's like, oh, that's a feminine, that's, that's a woman's thing. And I, I think with me and my position and where I've been, I've now come into much more balance with masculine and feminine. I used to be a very masculine-driven woman. I still am, but it's she's more balanced with the sense of... She. She, <laughs> yeah. This, this other side of me, which is much more... I know how to get into my creative place. How often I, do you go there? That's a good question. Uh, it depends. It really depends on the flow. So, so I was feel just the need to go there. <laughs> if I need to go there, that's right. And I ended up marrying a the the man who saw the the trend in my paintings. Who is he balances me very well. He's a musician, and he's also an acupuncturist. So he he definitely has that holistic mind. And ha him with music and me with art, painting art. It just it's a great connection. I just feel like that's it. That's what I want. I wanted that sense of whole, you know, being whole with, with my life. And I, I must say, I, I feel very blessed. I feel happy. I, I don't think people want to be healthy. I think they want to be happy. And, you know, you can have somebody who's completely unhealthy but incredibly happy, and they're like a magnet for everybody else. I mean, everybody just, they're just drawn to that. And I do think we want that sense of satisfaction in our lives where we feel endless. Again, I, I use the word flow a lot. Because people understand Again, that. very ironic for you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've had you have so many facets to yourself. I mean, it's it's just, I find you completely inspiring. So what on a what on a daily basis, whether it's conscious or unconscious, what inspires you? It's always different. There's not one thing. In fact, I used to live my life in a really regimented way, very structured, where I'd wake up, I had a day job, had to eat breakfast, you know, I did certain things, I read certain books to inspire me. When I started writing books, I stopped reading books. So that didn't inspire me anymore. And I really just went through life with a sense of wherever I needed to be, there would be different things that would inspire me. People who are... There are certain people that inspire me. I don't. I don't have a television, so I don't watch television in any way. I, I will watch movies. You're not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> I uh, I do watch movies. Movies inspire me. Movies stay with me a while. Uh, having certain conversations with people inspire me. Uh, people who I see really changing the world. I mean, I really feel like this call to service to help people on a larger. As one of my spiritual teachers would say, you know, being like a hollow bone for bringing through all this information, right? So I want to be, I want to help people with inspiring them in order to make changes because I don't think it's about information anymore. It's not listening to the latest podcast, even though I have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, this will be one, yes. <laughs> it, it, it is important for, there's something in there. If it inspires you, then it's important. I think people are so inundated with information but it's like, what is in that podcast or that television show or in that movie or in that conversation that's the spark? Oftentimes, there's a little glimmer of something. And that's what I want people to really connect to because that's what creates change, ultimately. So what has been the most rewarding part of your journey thus far? 
Being fortunate and blessed enough to have some really great teachers all throughout my life, there have been, I almost call them angels because they, somehow they have been in my lives at the, in my life at the right time to direct me in a certain way and I was very receptive to it in the moment. So certain people, um, being connected with them, I'm, I'm really grateful for them, I'm grateful for my parents. I mean, if I didn't have that, the, the mom with the food and faith at the age of eight, would I be talking with you right now? I don't know. Maybe I would have gone on a different course. Maybe I would have become a graphic designer or something. I kind of think about that these days. I love, you know, just graphics in general. So who knows where we would have gone, right? So, so many things are rewarding. I think um, for me, being in the seat of being an educator and just now even having this talk, I, I always feel that sense of, like, feeling great honor and great responsibility when I walk into a room and I'm giving information to practitioners or to people and really figuring out, like, how can I inspire them? You know, because, again, I want them to, to walk away. So I've lectured to thousands of audience of people in these audiences like now at the age of 46, and I just feel like, wow, that's a lot of lives. You know, I wasn't in, in practice. When I, I mean, everybody is affecting everybody else, but I feel so grateful that I've had the opportunity to get a large group of people all at once who are then serving other people. And I, want, I just feel that great responsibility to have the right information, the right inspiration, so that they are really called to that higher level of service. So for the medical practitioner or for the general public who are watching and listening to this, if they had to either implement or restrict themselves of one food in their diet, what would that be? First thing that comes to my mind is sugar. And it doesn't have to be all sugar. You know, I, I love honey. I think raw honey is great. I think fruit is great. When I was little and I used to say to my mom that I wanted cookie or candy, she used to say, go have a date. That's why I eat dates now. <laughs> and she's right. I mean, um, so what I usually say to people is if you're craving sugar, look at where you need more sweetness in your life. Because I do look at the symbolic, the metaphorical meaning of food as well and have some fun with it on the right side of the brain, right? Not the literal meaning, but what's a symbolic, like why am I drawn to sugar? So many people are stressed they have no time for themselves. I work with a lot of women who, their moms, you know, they're, they, they absolutely have no time. They're servicing many other people's needs, but not their own. And so it's how do they find that sweet spot for them, whether it's five minutes a day, in silence, on their own. Maybe they just go to the spa, they go and hang out and they read a book they like, they go and take a walk. But we have to find the sweetness in our own lives rather than getting it from something on the outside like sugar, which is really only fueling things that we don't want in the body. So you've, had, you've penned six books, correct? Six? Yeah, I have my seventh one coming out in January. It's called The Rainbow Diet. Looking forward to that. It's all about the color. <laughs> when was the last time you picked up a paintbrush? Uh, about a month ago. Yeah, uh, actually less than a month ago. I've been traveling for a bit now, so I haven't been home to, to do, I have a, an easel set up. I used to have it where when I would paint, I'd have to set everything up. And then I, my husband finally said to me, he's like, why don't you just have a set place so that you'll readily go and paint? He's such a smart man. <laughs> so I did that. I have my own spot where I have my, all my paints. I've got my easel. So yeah, when I'm home. And what do you do with it when you're done? Where's it hanging? Sometimes they're not. <laughs> they're just, I have so many now that I don't really have any room. Um, you didn't oftentimes have, did you I, ever give one to your gynecologist? <laughs> <laughs> I should give one to my gynecologist. Um, actually, her office is very pretty. She does have a number of prints on the wall that, that are very feminine. Um, but I give them away now. You know, I don't, um, you know, people feel drawn to them. In fact, I just recently donated... Uh, I live in Washington State, and there is a veterinarian that I've become friends with, and so she asked me for some paintings to donate to this. Um, and I'm all about animals. I love animals. I love cats, especially. But I donated, I think, four or five paintings that she selected to How their wonderful. cause. So I just, you know, I feel like if I attached money to it, it loses what I was not. I mean, money is energy. I have nothing against money, but to me, that's more. 
it's not something I'm doing for a living. That's just something I'm doing for fun. And if people like it, that's great. <laughs> so so that's, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, I, that's a really good question, and I've been reflecting on that. Um, I work with different coaches and spiritual teachers and such, and I do think that I will continue as the three things that I've been, so writer, teacher, and um, some, some would say healer, that I am in the healing arts and work in that. So I think I'll be doing all those things. I'm really interested in quantum physics. I'm really interested in more unification of the art and science. I'd like to develop different technologies. There's that side of me that's still very curious scientifically. At the same time, I want to help people and inspire them with personal growth and techniques and things like that. So I don't know, probably more of the same. Maybe writing more, maybe getting more into spirituality. I want to leave it open to the flow. You know, really, I, I've always been goal oriented. So, you know, so, everything was four years. It's like, I'm going to finish this degree. And I was like a horse with blinders on. And now at the age of, you know, kind of going into my menopausal period of life, you know, I kind of feel like, let's just see where we go. <laughs> I think we'll end it right there. Thank you so much for your time. Really quite inspiring. Oh, thank you so much. You had great questions. Thank you.